So thanks for joining us from Oxford today. Um, this is your first time uh, live in possibly uh, Indian social media. I mean, all this while you've been uh, speaking to uh, through the to various Chinese platforms. Uh, so welcome to <laughs> uh, the non-Chinese social media and thanks for joining us. How is the weather there in Oxford? Is it beautiful? Is it good? How, how does it feel to be in uh, quarantine for, for a while? Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Annas. Uh, yeah, and I'm normally based in Shanghai for the most part, um, but since the middle of January, I sort of came over to the UK um, with a little suitcase packed for enough clothes for a week. And, and since the middle of January, I haven't really moved because at the end of January, the coronavirus impact in China was a lot more significant than, than I'd expected. So we delayed our trip back. And then, um, as the Chinese economy was still closed, um, until much, um, really until the end, until the beginning of March, we sort of decided as a family to stay in Oxford. And we're quite lucky because we don't live in the big town, we don't live in London, you know, we live in Oxford where we have more space. And we have a couple, and, and so in that sense, I feel very lucky. Um, some of the big impacts for me has been that, um, you know, sort of, in the UK, obviously, we're in lockdown, not in, not in quarantine, but lockdown. So that means that we're not really allowed to meet out, meet outside of the house. Um, we go to the supermarket once a week if we can. Um, we get deliveries um, uh, where we can, but in the countryside near Oxford, it's very difficult to get deliveries. And so it's, it's quite an impact in that sense. Um, but it also means that the likes of uh, video conferences, Seeing social media uh, has become a much, much uh, larger part of my life than I've ever uh, used before. So, in that sense, it's actually been a, a positive, if you like. And for for me personally, one of the biggest impacts has been, as of last week, China closed its borders to non-Chinese nationals. And so, even though I have a long-term visa for China, which is a five or ten-year visa. And it means that I'm not allowed to go back according to the Chinese government regulations. And the big question is, how long will that last for? I can see the logic. I think this has been a game plan of China for the last month or so. I think they've had this in, in their minds because it, as we speak today, we're just under a million known cases of coronavirus in the world. And, and so I imagine that means that if any airplane came into China, or not just in China, but anywhere in the world, arrives on your borders, that's probably going to have uh, a certain percentage of uh, live cases of coronavirus on, on that. And they're really scared of the second wave of coronavirus sort of uh, taking off in China. So this my big question, and a lot of my friends in China are asking the similar sort of questions, was how long is this border shutdown going to last for in China? And my opinion, it could be anywhere between one month, which is sort of on the optimistic side, to more realistically, probably three to possibly four months. So that means that the Chinese border will be closed probably until about August, um, potentially as, as long as that. Uh, this is my personal opinion, without any insider knowledge whatsoever. And um, in answer to your question, uh, it's been really nice weather in Oxford, <laughs> and, and yeah, it's 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 been nice weather, a bit bit chilly, but actually very nice weather. What about you in Mumbai? It's uh, pretty good. We can't. We are not really in a uh, position to enjoy the weather now because we've been in lockdown for the last ten days, and hopefully, uh, another uh, uh, couple of weeks' time, we should possibly be going out and enjoying uh, the weather. <laughs> um, I would stay straight away jump into one question, which has been running around everybody's minds, and not I'll get your insights about it. There's a huge discussion in all the social media uh, 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 saying that you no, know, this whole thing was caused by China to uh, for its benefit and uh, possibly the the, um, uh, the virus was manufactured there or you know, and uh, this will later on uh, benefit China from an economic perspective and everything. So going by that logic, you know, the Chinese economy should possibly be doing really really well now. Uh, so from your perspective, how do you look at it? What are your what is your knowledge? And how is the economy doing? What is the after effects? Um, if you could just give some overview on that, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Anas. 
Well, I mean, first of all, just to help people understand who perhaps not so familiar with the Hurun report, um, the Hurun report was set up 20 years ago in um, London and Shanghai. And we started out by trying to tell the story of the Chinese economy through the stories of the most successful entrepreneurs in China. That was the whole essence of what the Hurun report um, was doing. And it took off, became very popular in China. You know, probably hitting the best part of almost a billion view list um, uh, in China, which is you know quite quite a lot. And the reason I suppose it took off so much is because people prior to Huran Report didn't really have much of an idea as to who the most successful Chinese And, and you see the impact of some of the views who, again, not so familiar with us. Back about eight years ago, uh, when Anas and I first met, And he was thinking about what his next most successful entrepreneurs. And again, I think over the last grown, and we can see through the stories of these entrepreneurs, because the thing that's so exciting about the entrepreneurs, they're individuals. You know, Jeff Bezos is an individual, so he gets divorced, you know, like many people in the world. And what happens? the stories that happen you know one third of his wealth gets um, taken by his ex-wife and and that has an impact as well so i suppose that's the essence of what we do and then we've expanded to go well beyond the entrepreneurs but we look at um, art and we look at philanthropy and, and lots of other different topics so that's just sort of as a very simple background behind who run report um, i'm the founder of it anis is the founder of who in india so uh, that's sort of where we fit in. And regarding your comments about, you know, sort of the origin of the virus and the Chinese economy and stuff like that, I think, you know, sort of from what my understanding is, you know, the first known cases in the world were coming out of Wuhan in China. Now, Wuhan's a big city. It's one of the, probably the fastest growing cities in China, or it was, at any rate. And, and it's got a population of well over 10 million people. And, and it was, you know, it's 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 considered to be a very, very, uh, you know, very strong education. Uh, with a little great eat somebody from Wuhan, in China, you automatically think, but well, this is somebody who's been very well educated. You know, it's considered to be very clever people coming out of Wuhan as well. Uh, Wuhan was one of the first cities to install almost a, um, a full. full And so it seems to be that the first known cases in the world originated um, from Wuhan. The Chinese government then came down very hard, as far as my understanding is, um, and um, sort of managed to control the virus, at least the first wave of, of virus. Uh, of the employees and my company and a lot of the entrepreneurs and everybody around me. And it had an impact because um, the economy basically stopped. It went to, went to sleep. And, you know, and it just happened at around Chinese New Year, which is normally, you know, it's a high point for travel because a lot of people travel and restaurants and stuff like that. So hospitality industry is normally a high point of the year. So that all came to a complete dead stop. And then um, we've since sort of, seen that the whole economy, which was slowing anyway, you know, you know by India standards, and um, you know, it, it was a mere six percent growth, which I understand India was targeting a higher growth rate than that. So China's economy had been slowing anyway, um, and then the coronavirus came and just hit it on the head, and it's actually uh, creating a, a, a big, you know, sort of challenge, if you like. 
um, for the policymakers of how to re-stimulate the economy, because not only are they dealing with a slowing China economy, but they're now having to take into account the impact of a recession globally. And so that's having a, a, a big impact, I think, on the on, on, on you know, China's economy, you know, sort of coming back together again. But having said that, the staff in my company in Shanghai, they've been at work pretty much normally now for about a month. So Chinese Wuhan went into lockdown on 22nd of January, and basically six weeks later, and Shanghai was pretty much back to normal-ish. Not quite normal, but, you know, and not all public areas were completely open, but, you know, pretty much everybody could go to work as normal without having face masks and whatnot. But the challenge now is to try and rebuild confidence in the economy as a whole, and, and also to try and find a way out of this global recession that, that's coming. And to your point about, you know, sort of, well, which sectors, if you like, in China have benefited um, significantly from the coronavirus, um, well, I, I think it's clear to a lot of people that online education has, has had a big um, impact, and, you know, sort of because pretty much all the children in the world today are, if, uh, are at home doing online education, doing distance learning. And, and, and we've never in the history, of, uh, certainly in my lifetime, um, seen the traditional education sector have to embrace full on distance learning and online education. So the, there's a handful of, of um, online education companies that have done incredibly well, basically in the last two months and, and have signed up tens of millions of new people. Uh, or new new students, if you like, and to to help and uh, to, to help them with uh, get through this tough time, you know, because a lot of them still keep learning. They've got exams. They've got to get into university and stuff like that. So I think online age education. I, I, there's a couple of people um, like Gun uh, Shui, which sounds probably not very doesn't. It's difficult to pronounce in English. Um, but their their share price has almost doubled pretty much in the last in the last couple of months, and so that anyway, so that's that's one sector that's definitely had a very strong growth. The other sector is the um, medical sector. So a lot of the ventilators, a lot of the leading manufacturers of ventilators in China, have seen their share price you know grow quite significantly, like thirty percent or something. Um, you know, a lot of the I think there's one company. Um, uh, called AllMed, which has seen its share price, you know, sort of almost double, I would say, and they do protective equipment, <laughs> kind of like obvious. You know. yeah. So it's obviously grown tremendously, not just because of the international market, but in fact also because China's having sort of got through the first wave of coronavirus, and they're now having to build up a lot of and you know, stock, if you like, just in case a second wave comes. So first they have to get, get all the stock ready for the local market, um, for the China domestic market, I should say. And then at the same time, you've got this massive need globally now in Italy, in Spain, even in the US and UK and everywhere. They, everybody's desperate to to uh, buy uh, ventilators and protective equipment and 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 another sort of medical medical related stuff, so I think those two industries have had very strong impact. You know, have had strong growth, if that's the right expression. But as a whole, um, coronavirus has been a, a big challenge for the Chinese economy. So I don't hold much, and I don't think there's much point in these conspiracy theories. And I can't see the benefit if this was a China-created virus. Well, they've harmed themselves incredibly badly. And the virus, for example, which is what the Chinese um, and some Chinese media are, are putting out. Um, well, I mean, the U.S. is clearly not done very much preparation um, for for what, from what we can see today, and is suffering very badly, it doesn't really make sense. I think much more likely it was an accident. 
Um, this is my personal opinion and an accident that having happened, it's then we can see how different countries, be it China, be it India, be it US, U.S., be it European countries, and now we're looking also in, into Africa and, and Middle East. You know how they're dealing with it, and and, and pretty much how 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 they how they're dealing with it. Some sectors will go up very much. You know we've seen, and um, one of the the, the biggest yes, the right expressions probably doesn't sound quite right. Right, this um, hang on, I'm just. One, one of the biggest winners of um, the last two months, at least as far as their share price is concerned, is an online video conference company called Zoom. And it was actually founded by a Chinese about eight years ago. He's a young-ish guy. He's probably 40, 50 years old. Um, and um, he started the business because he wanted to talk to his girlfriend in China. He was based in Silicon Valley. And then he managed to go IPO probably as little as six months ago, which is almost perfect timing, was doing a massive advertising campaign because he just on here. And now, just the US, sorry, I'll just wait. It's, his share price has gone up by 80% in the US. And, and you know, so that everybody is now knows about Zoom. And that's despite the U.S. markets having gone down 30%. <laughs> uh, so and the, the final comment I would say is that overall, the Chinese stock market since January the 1st has actually um, only, only gone down by about 10%. That, that, that's relatively speaking, not a lot. In the U.S. and in Europe, the stock markets have gone down by about 30%. So a much, much heavier hit. So And, and pretty much in the last month, Chinese stock market has been relatively stable. And by Chinese, I'm talking about uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen predominantly. Uh, Hong Kong has gone down pretty much similar to the US. Um, the US market has gone down. And, and I'd be interested to hear about what you're thinking about the India impact as well. I've lost you on sound, Anas. Oh, sorry. Hello. I was on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So Indian uh, share markets were pretty much uh, <laughs> pretty much tanked over the last uh, uh, last one month. It's been really bad. Uh, it was not just the coronavirus impact. It is also coupled with the uh, the oil price war uh, between the OPEC region and uh, Russia. So that's definitely had an impact as well. Uh, but we were also heading towards a, a mini. Uh, 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 kind of degrowth uh, in the economy anyway, and that's when all these things happened. So, yeah, but but it takes me to a very uh, uh, very important question. Uh, um, I remember having a discussion with, with you, and you told me uh, that China is going to see further slowdown, right? And stock market has just come down by 10 percent or something, right? Uh, uh, so, do you think the worst in terms of let's say share markets or the economy? for a country like India, where the virus has just started getting in, is yet to come, going by the trends in, let us say, China? Um, well, I think from an economy, e economy point of view, one of the advantages that India has is you're able to see what happened in China, what happened, if what is happening in Europe, what is happening in America. So you've got almost three months of data, if you like, to be able to try and avoid the worst, hopefully, um, that other countries are, 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 have gone through. And to pick up on the mistakes that other countries made and also the successes that other countries put in place. So I think being later in the, in, 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 on the graph, if you like, and does have an advantage, hopefully should have an advantage. Some of the sort of fiscal policies that were put out by the European governments and, and a little bit later by the US government, and these can be sort of studied and analyzed, hopefully sort of, and, you know, sort of improved upon, if you like, 
for an India context. Because to put a lot of people into lockdown in certainly in places like the UK, where I am based at the moment, and is extremely tough on uh, self-employed people, on people on uh, low salaries, because a lot of their companies just just can't uh, maintain, uh, you know, paying salaries. Uh, you know, they can maintain for one or two months, but if this goes on for three, four, five months, they won't be able to do that, and 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 their, their businesses would go bankrupt. So the government has tried to put out policy here to help the lower, and uh, you know, it's called furlough, the new word that everybody's talking about. But uh, it means that those who, have a, uh, who are in the lower income area, um, they can get up to 80% of their salary from the government. And that way they can pay their rent, they can pay their basic food expenses um, without too much worry. And that way they will also stay at home and actually stay, be willing to stay in lockdown. Um, I think for many people to be in lockdown for three weeks is, is something that people would accept. But if it goes on significantly longer than three weeks, it does become quite painful, especially for people who are living on their own um, or who don't really have a, a formal means of income. So my biggest sort of concern is less on the in the India market in particular, um, but is more about a global recession. Because if we're going to be looking at the numbers, you know, I saw the numbers that the US is expected to be, to, to shrink this year, to go into recession. Originally, I think it was supposed to grow about 3%, and now there's a talk about it actually shrinking based on the latest numbers I saw in the Economist, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and is potentially shrinking about 2%. The UK economy is expected to shrink by 5%. The German economy is expected to shrink by 7%. The China economy was originally going to grow by 6%, but according to the EIU, the Economist Intelligence Unit, they expect now just to grow by 1%. In fact, the largest growth in the world, according to the EIU, is expected to come from India. You know, because uh, again, a much slower growth than expected, but it's still expected to grow uh, at say 2% or something is, is, is the, the data that I have seen. But all that translates into a world recession. And in a world recession, you know, sort of the, uh, a lot of supply chains get affected. And, uh, you know, perhaps uh, Americans and Europeans buy less cars, but that, that has a greater impact on the whole supply chain of the automobile industry. And so I think on these sort of traditional sectors, it's a very, very um, big headache, <laughs> is all I can say. But from our Huron Reports point of view, what we can analyze, we can look at where the wealth creation is coming from. Because in all these difficult times, you're going to still have, uh, you know, silver linings. And the silver linings are clearly in the new tech and industries. You know, sort of, we've seen and talked already about video conferencing, online video conferencing, but the whole of that online entertainment Digital entertainment, you know, uh, is, is going through a strong surge. Anything to do with 5G and internet is going through a strong surge, um, you know. And then you've still got the, the what I call the A, B, C, D, E industries, the, the new sectors of AI, um, blockchain, cloud, data, e-commerce, fintech, and so on and so forth, edtech. And they're all, you know, sort of looking at um, you know, still continued fast growth. And uh, we, we haven't seen the valuations of these businesses going down. If anything, they're still going up just because they are part of the mega trend that, that, that the next generation uh, of, of the economy is going to be looking at. Uh, you need to put it on to off mute. Yeah, so one of the, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing it for the first time. <laughs> Thank you for this. Yeah, so one of the uh, interesting trends that was there was the shared economy right which include the co-working spaces or the shared uh, autom like ubers and uh, dd or ola and all those guys right now because of uh, now possibly in the world post corona uh, i think one of the sectors that could get affected would be the shared economy now just today a news came out that softbank is going to pull out of the uh, the weworks transaction and completely going to stay away from wework Right, and uh, so I see a huge negative impact uh, uh, being affected on the shared the shared economy space. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the I and mean, we do as her and report just for the purpose of some of the the listeners. Uh, we put out a, a list that I'm very proud of. It's called the Current Global Unicorn List, and we've searched the world for the unicorns which are worth more than one billion U.S. dollars. That's the definition of a unicorn, and it's a privately held company, i.e., not not yet publicly listed, with a valuation of over one billion U.S. dollars, and that was founded. So in the world, we have 500 unicorns, and as of today, and those in the shared economy probably make up, if I remember correctly, about just under 10 percent. Uh, do you remember the exact number? Uh, anyway, it's it's about it's it's around 10 percent, yeah, just below 10 percent. And and we've seen the valuations of these shared economy uh, units that have been very very significantly impacted over the last say two years, pretty much since. Um, Airbnb, uh, was it? No, it was Uber. Since the IPO of Uber, and which didn't do, which didn't do as well as expected, and and then we followed with the uh, crash, if you like, in the valuation of WeWork, which is shared office space, um, and and then and we, but the the Chinese equivalent. So the Chinese equivalent of Uber is a company called Didi. They seem to still be holding the value. It's still a big company. I mean, don't get me wrong. These still are very, very big companies. And, you know, it still commands a valuation of about 60 billion US dollars. And so that, that it's still very significant. Um, so I, I think the shared economy overall is one that's here to stay. And the issue really is in what, how do you monetize it? In the right way. So I think the shared economy concept people have bought into. You know, a lot of you know, businesses like 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 who run report, and you know, sort of we we would we've probably got two main offices in Shanghai and Mumbai, um, but a lot of our satellite offices we would actually be putting them into uh, shared shared uh, in, into shared office space, uh, mainly because you've got one or two people working in a satellite office. Maybe we've got ten satellite offices around the world. I'd say about half of them are in. Shared, shared office space, and the advantage means that if you suddenly find you're going to hire an extra two or three people, and it's very cheap, and if you want to, but if you have an office of one person, you know, and then they suddenly they leave or something, you're not going to have a, a big overhead there as well. So I, I see the the value of shared of the shared economy as being there, but it's just a matter of how do you actually interpret. The revenues that can come from it. Um, I, I, the, the the advantage that I sorry, the example that I always like is in the shared music space. So I remember clearly about sort of 15 years ago when we had this um, uh, new kid on the block and um, for Napster, um, which was very very popular. About you could sort of go online and you can get pretty much download any music that you ever heard of. However, the issue that that business eventually failed, but the concept that it left behind is still very, very popular today with the likes of Apple Music and Spotify and, and, and Chinese equivalents like QQ Music and stuff like that. So the actual concept of the shared economy, I think it's very much there to stay. It's just a matter of are some of the companies slightly, did they get the business model slightly wrong? And you know, Napster, Got the business model wrong. It was possibly being led by the wrong person, and as a company, it then failed. Um, but the disruptive technology concept is there and is there to stay. And we're seeing and reaping the benefits, if you like, of Napster's original disruptive idea. And it's just it wasn't Napster that actually won. But as for me or you and many of our listeners today, the people who um, um, you know who use music. Uh, you know, apps. Uh, Napster did a great service because we don't really care whether it's Napster or or QQ Music or Spotify or Apple Music that's providing the service, as long as we can get the music. <laughs> so, so, so um, yeah, I, I think it's the same with the. Uh, I think it's the same with the shared economy as well. So I think the likes of uh, shared cars like Uber and and Oya and and, and OK Cars and stuff like that. I think, and Didi in China, I think that that sector is here to stay. It's just who's actually going to be the one who leads it. 
and ditto with shared office space, whether it's Riga's office space. We noticed how on our global rich list the other day when we put out a month ago, and the biggest loser on, on the whole global rich list was this guy called, who's about 40 years old, Adam Newman, and who's the founder of WeWork and has actually since left WeWork in the last six months or a year or so. And um, his wealth went down 80%. You know, he's still got a billion US dollars, so he's not a poor guy. Um, but um, he, 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 his wealth was the biggest faller. He lost sort of five billion, four billion US dollars in, in one year. And, 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 and at the same time, one of the biggest winners this year was, funny enough, also in the shared office space. He's a founder, and I can't remember his name, um, but he's the founder behind Regus, which is another shared office space. And they've been around for 20 years or so. And his wealth went up by 60, 70 <laughs> percent on a smaller base, mind you. Um, but it was one of the biggest uh, winners because as WeWork's valuation came down, people suddenly recognized that they were doing exactly the same thing, been doing it for 20 years, and his valuation. So they now have similar valuations. One was, and um, with hindsight, we sort of used the expression overhyped, that's WeWork, and the other one was undervalued, which was Regus. And now they're sort of balanced out and they're coming in a similar sort of uh, thing. But the concept of shared office space, I think, is here. I think people are And so, yeah, I, I'm, still, I'm still a fan of that um, space. Uh, see, uh, one, interesting, uh, one interesting factor now is uh, literally uh, in the UK, uh, uh, the person who was in charge of the whole uh, the coronavirus crisis is uh, the son-in-law of Mr. Narayan Murthy of Infosys, right? Uh, Rushi Sandhu, who is the, the finance minister equivalent in the UK. Um, I mean, reading in Financial Times that he might even be considered uh, to be the next prime minister or acting prime minister if uh, Boris is you know, going to be on extended leave because of coronavirus and stuff. Uh, so how has it been? You know, what has happened to the UK economy and uh, how, how are you guys managing it? Uh, do you uh, have you guys started uh, seeing light at the other end of the tunnel? How has it been for you? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, on the comment on Rishi Sunak, I mean, I know that he was born and bred in the UK, but and he is a very good example of someone of Indian origin being extremely successful um, abroad. You know, I remember very clearly about a year or two ago when you know, sort of, we saw the very senior people at Google and and Apple and various other places, you know, sort of also, and you know, the Indian impact, or maybe it's just the IIT impact. I'm not sure on and um, on some of the Silicon Valley and uh, big companies has been extremely significant. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, and in the UK, has put together a quite well received package on how to, uh, you know, sort of get at least keep Brits in lockdown. And I think that was the first stage, is that if we're going to stop this virus, you have to keep people in lockdown, because the, the concept is that if you keep people in lockdown, the virus has got nowhere to go. <laughs> That's the, it's really simple. I mean, you know, if everybody's at home for three weeks, then you've either got, got it in your home, and you're, there's no way for you to catch it, basically. Um, so. That's that's the sort of the that's the theory behind it. But in, in order to persuade uh, Brits to stay at home, the woes and, and struggles that a lot of people would face, and that would, they would continue working, and just to pay the rent and to pay their their, their food bills and energy bills and electricity and stuff like that. So I think uh, Rishi or Mr. Sunak has done a really good job there. And the biggest issue that I've got is, as you say, the light at the end of the tunnel. And the news that I heard today, which was, or yesterday, I should say, which slightly upsets me, was that Wimbledon tennis championships in, in June had been cancelled, that, uh, that also the Edinburgh Festival in August had been cancelled. Now, not specifically worried about losing the, the tennis championships or the Edinburgh Festival, which is a big theatre festival. That's not so much the point, but the point was more the time scale. You know, we've seen that the Tokyo Olympics in August have been have been um, delayed for a whole year. So 
this virus doesn't seem, based on that sort of um, long-term delays, this virus is not going anywhere for four or five months because the British government has now cancelled uh, an August festival. And a lot of people, I think, felt that you know, this might be over within two months or three months, a bit like in China or some of that. If they get total control, then this could be, you know, we could open up the economy again. But it looks like um, this is not going to be over for four or five months. And I think the, 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 the likes of myself and many of the entrepreneurs that I know, we're all sort of trying to put together and formulate strategies and plans, uh, assuming that this is not not going to go back to normal for six months. And, and if that's the case, well, how am I going to restructure my business? What am I going to do with my employees? How am I going to find putting in alternatives in place? Um, and that's just for my and some of the entrepreneur friends I've got around me. And so it, it is a big headache. Now, of course, that might be the worst case scenario. And, it might actually open up much earlier, but on a, on a layered level, which is what we're being led to believe. Um, but the, no, my, my single biggest headache is basically how is it going to work post lockdown? Now, from a from my because China, as I said before, in my office has been open for four weeks, but because of the global recession and because of a slowdown that was happening anyway in China, we're not seeing much growth. If any, go to work as he has got a network issue. People are able to go to work. People are able to go to restaurants. Um, people are able to meet up as normal-ish. However, there's not much business being done. <laughs> so, so um, and, and, and China is affected being out of the lockdown for four weeks, and they've, they've started reviving it. And, and, and so it, it is a big tricky one. It is a big tricky one. And, you know, China has closed its borders to non-Chinese. That's a big step. And it's been closed now for almost a week. And that, that's, that's a really, really big thing. And it, does that mean that the UK and India and, and other countries are going to also follow suit? And for how long? I think as an entrepreneur, and I... As, as a recent and we need to become just in case a moment to to change their business and um, you know sort of come through this and uh, in, in in, in, in whatever way they can. So uh, uh, you've heard of India. What's happened? Can you hear me? Yeah. So I yeah. think one final question. Maybe we can do this every week uh, in terms of how is it progressed and you know what are we what are our thoughts on the various parts of the world's economy and the growth and stuff. But one final question to ask you. You know, India. What's happened is a complete lockdown. Uh, but India being India. Uh, uh, we've definitely had instances where uh, uh, religious congregations, you know, breaking uh, the lockdown and you know um, all that stuff happening parallel. It's, it's a very, it's a big, vast country, unlike the UK, um, and very diverse as well. Uh, so, what would be your thoughts on what can India learn from uh, what's happening from the rest of the world, and what can India not learn? I think one one of the things that we possibly have done quite well. Uh, with which Mr. Most, Mr. Modi has done quite well is to ensure that the lockdown is done sooner than later. Uh, didn't wait for uh, a lot of cases to happen before the lockdown. Um, uh, I mean, some people might debate that it was late anyway, but then I think it was done sooner than later. Uh, but what else can we learn from the rest of the world, uh, in, or what what else can we not learn? Yeah, well, I think the simple answer is one way to enforce the lockdown is obviously you can enforce it 
quite uh, strictly with police and, and the military. But at the end of the day, if you can persuade people that this in a if you can persuade people that this is in their best interests, and then give them the economic um, power, if you like, to 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 be in lockdown for a, for a few weeks, and I think that's something that you know certainly India can look to, uh, you know, sort of what Europe and America and other democracies are, are, are doing to enforce to enforce this lockdown, or not to enforce it to to make the lockdown happen successfully. But I think for most people, the biggest issue is what's going to happen post lockdown. And and, uh, and that Japan. I think the biggest issue for most people and most policymakers is what's going to happen post lockdown. And I think for that, we need to look at what's, uh, how South Korea has dealt with it post lockdown, how Japan, Singapore, China, and then hopefully by the time that, you know, sort of, um, you know, it, 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 it's getting more serious in India, other countries in Europe will be able to start having um, ways out that we can learn from. But I think one thing that's really clear is that this is something that we all have to deal with together. I mean, if you have a big country that doesn't deal with it properly, it's going to impact the rest of the world. So um, my understanding is that there's a lot more discussion happening amongst the medical peers and the senior medical officers of all the big countries in the world than 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 I than I think a lot more discussion is happening than we than we probably know about. And, and so one of my family is a is a senior medical person uh, in a, in a hospital here in in the UK, and she was telling me that they have a conference calls with um, a lot of the other European countries, their their peers, all the time. So there's a lot of learning from each other at the medical side, and I'm sure that a lot of that is going on at the um, and government policy side as well. But my job, really, the I'm not a medical guy, we're not a policy people either. But what Hurun Report is all about is about trying to seek out those interesting wealth creation ideas. Because if you can identify these trends, that can give light to a lot of people, that can um, give confidence and some optimism. You see where wealth is being destroyed, and you can see where wealth is being created. Then we should be trying, as Who Run Report, to try and highlight those wealth creation opportunities. And you know, previously we've done the Who Run uh, Global Rich List and the India Rich List and the China Rich List, like once a year. But I think there is an argument for actually updating it a little bit more frequently, especially in these very very difficult times, to give people an idea as to where the wealth creating opportunities are coming. Now, not everybody is going to become a billionaire. That's not the purpose of the list, um, but on the, on the other hand, we can be completely certain that a lot of the people starting out their business today will become important business people in in twenty years' time, in ten years' time, and so you know, uh, and I think that's our job is to try and help ident help people through Facebook Live, through the work that you do and I do to um, understand more about where the wealth creating opportunities are that that is our job yes super i think uh, uh, that would uh, to summarize our discussions that we had i think uh, one uh, uh, interesting or one possibly analysis and your conclusion is this is not a conspiracy theory and uh, the virus was not invented by china according to you and uh, it was basically the econ Chinese economy has also been hit pretty bad uh, and uh, you expect uh, some uh, headwinds and uh, times to come. And secondly, UK, the very fact that the, the likes of a festival in the August has been pushed and possibly the Wimbledon in June has been pushed and so on indicates that it's a long haul in the sense that this could be a problem for the next five to six months. So all the businesses have to be prepared for that. If something like that can happen in a small country like UK, in a big country like India, the situation could be 
possibly even be you know uh, at least at par with those so so that's one thing that we have to be prepared with uh, as a, uh, as a, a business and as an entrepreneur and uh, finally i mean um, india definitely has an advantage in terms of learning uh, from the rest of the economies so you know we are possibly uh, three times ahead in terms of learning three months ahead in terms of learning and possibly we can uh, inculcate all those learnings and try and get this virus out of our country asap um that's pretty much it from my side do you have any final message to our uh, the people who are watching the live no, thank you very much indeed anas um, for 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 making this this has happened i mean i i suppose the the, the final which went on the lines yeah uh, i didn't know if you got that so everything will yeah, be right in the end and if it's not right it's not the end so <laughs> i i think and you know sometimes we feel there's a lot of challenge around us um it's our job if you like to try and sort of find the light and at the end of the tunnel and and to 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 try and identify it. but at the moment it's looking pretty bleak um especially with a global recession and on our uh, you know on our horizons um but through every global recession there will still be new industries coming out and i think that's the key message is you know let's see what we can do to try and identify and then be a part of this new mega trends and i think you know because mega trends are much bigger than just like a small trend of a of a virus or some of that mega trends is like you know a whole new industrial revolution and if we can sort of identify that mega trend part of that and uh, that will benefit not family but you your family your economy your country and potentially well beyond that as well so that that is sort of my my message but uh, you know just just another thing it's just i i um just say a little comment on what i consider to be the five traits that you need to be a successful entrepreneur and the first one is vision i think you need to be able to identify what's going to happen tomorrow and you know either through being super clever or having good good uh, network of contacts the second one is you need to have a certain bravery you need to be able to throw yourself in to become an entrepreneur and the third one is you need to have the right judgment at the right points in time you need to know when to give up or when to double down and the fourth the fourth one is you need leadership you need to be able to and um, you know identify you know be able to persuade people to come and work for you persuade your customers to and um, you know uh, to take your to pay you first and then to get the product <laughs> you know and 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 by this the reverse for for suppliers and so on So you need good leadership so it policy makers to to support you and then finally we all need lady luck and not misfortune uh, whatever you do you need to be a little bit lucky and, and and not unlucky and i think in those are the five sort of secrets if you like of a successful entrepreneur is in in, in the way i've sort of noticed it and so i think that's just something that you can think about as well Yeah, thank you, Rupert. I think uh, thanks for your message, and to all of you, this is the first time we're doing a live like this. Uh, not much marketing was done. It is more of a, a testing ground for us for the first time. We'll try to come up with something interesting every week and uh, try and see how all this progresses and keep you updated about what's happening in India, UK, rest of the world, China. You know, on a more regular basis. Um, uh, the network wasn't wasn't the the best today. and supported by my children's background music <laughs> so next time i'll be a little more careful on that yeah but thank you very much have a, a good uh, uh, thursday night and uh, until we meet uh, you know see you the next time thank you rupert thank you everyone bye rupert thank you bye bye